This video is part of a series about the AQA A-level chemistry topic of transition metals. It follows on from a more general video about variable oxidation states and it looks at redox titrations using transition metals. Titration is a technique that can be used to find out the unknown concentration of a substance by reacting it with the second substance that does have a known concentration and seeing what volume of the second substance is required to make the reaction reach its end point. You'll have done quite a lot of acid-base titration as part of your year 12 chemistry and depending on where you are in physical chemistry at the moment you might also have looked at titrations with weak acids and weak bases as part of year 13 physical chemistry. You should be familiar with these pieces of apparatus and know how to use a burette and how to use a volumetric pipette. In terms of setting up a redox titration and also doing the calculations at the end, there's very little that's actually different to an acid-base titration. The biggest thing is about how we know where the end point is. So redox titrations involve the titration of either a reducing agent by an oxidising agent or an oxidising agent by a reducing agent. And they don't need to use a pH indicator because usually they have a redox indicator. So what that means is you have a reactant that involves a transition metal. And so because it's a transition metal, it has variable oxidation states. And because it has variable oxidation states, it also has a colour change. And so when the reaction reaches its end point, we see that colour change. Now, not every transition metal will be appropriate uh, because in the same way that we would never use universal indicator in an acid base titration, we need to have um, an end point that has a really clear colour change. Um, so manganate ions are a classic example for this because they have a really clear and obvious colour change from when um, they're in their plus seven oxidation state, um, where there's this nice purple colour, to where they're in a plus two oxidation state and, um, and the solution becomes colourless. When using manganese as a redox indicator, it's normal to use purple potassium permanganate as a source of the manganate ions, in which manganese has an oxidation state of plus seven. And they have this really nice purple colour. But as the manganese is reduced to make manganese two plus ions, that purple colour is lost and the solution becomes colourless. Now, this reduction will only happen under acidic conditions. In addition to the fact that we're trying to remove that oxygen from the manganese and therefore we need some hydrogen ions to be able to do that, the acidic conditions also prevent the formation of manganese dioxide, which is a very dark brown precipitate. And the problem with that occurring is that it would mask the colour change. So because there's that dark brown precipitate forming, you wouldn't be able to see the colour change to purple. So it's really, really important that the solution that you're titrating with is sufficiently acidic. So we always make sure that we add a big excess of acid so that there's no chance of this manganese dioxide precipitate forming. When it comes to acidifying potassium permanganate, really our only choice is sulfuric acid. Firstly, we have to use a strong acid because it's really important that that solution is really acidic to prevent that formation of the precipitate. So it wouldn't be appropriate to use a carboxylic acid like ethanoic acid. But even when it comes to strong acids, our options are limited. We can't use hydrochloric acid because of the chloride ions. Those chloride ions can be oxidised by the manganate ions. And so you'd end up using some manganate for the titration you're actually trying to do, but also having some manganate ions reacting with the acid. So you'd end up using more manganate than you really meant to, and your numbers for the titration would be completely wrong. We also can't use nitric acid because nitric acid is itself a really good oxidising agent. And so it will react with whatever it is that you're trying to oxidise. And therefore, you'd end up using less manganate than you meant to. So either one of those strong acids would give us wrong numbers for our titration. So instead, we use sulfuric acid. Here are a few summary questions just to check you are listening. So why is it that in these titrations we acidify the potassium permanganate? Why is sulfuric acid a good choice of acid for this? And why don't we need to use an indicator? So the mixture is acidified to make sure that all of those permanganate ions actually react and are reduced to form Mn2+, because if that happens, then it will turn colourless. If there wasn't enough acid and it wasn't possible to reduce all of them, then even if there was still something in the conical flask of the manganate ions to react with, they would remain purple and we would see that colour change prematurely. Sulfuric acid is a good choice because it's a strong acid and also because it doesn't participate in any further redox reactions that are going to influence the results. And finally, we don't need to use a pH indicator because the reaction is self-indicating. It produces this um, endpoint because the solution starts out colourless and when the manganate ions become in excess and there's nothing left to, um, to reduce them, then they turn purple or they stay purple and so we see that endpoint. 
it's worth you being aware that instead of potassium permanganate, it is possible to do a redox titration with potassium dichromate. Now, this one isn't mentioned in the AQA specification anymore, but there are a lot of practice questions that mention it. And also, it's one of those things where they could just sort of throw some information at you and expect you to figure it out. So if you've met it before, then you don't panic in the exam. So potassium dichromate can be used in exactly the same way as potassium permanganate, except for the fact that actually it's not quite as powerful an oxidising agent. So it's not going to work for every kind of titration. You're going to need to use some electrochemistry data to figure out whether it would be an appropriate oxidising agent to use for a particular species. Also, it's not actually self-indicating. So there are three different indicators that you can use with it, all of which turn from green to violet. But you're going to have to add those in as well. The classic example of a redox titration that you're really likely to have done at A-level is using potassium permanganate to figure out the percentage purity of some iron tablets. But you might also have done some slightly more inventive versions of this, like um, titrating for the amount of iron in some thyme or in some spinach or some other food that contains iron. In addition to using potassium permanganate to work out what the concentration of iron ions in a solution is, we can also use them to investigate the concentration of ethane dioate, or as I'm more likely to call them, oxalate ions. Now, since I've actually put a photograph on this slide, I should point out that one of the problems with doing a manganate um, titration is that it can be really hard to see the meniscus because obviously the colour is quite dark and the meniscus is really happening in 3D. So the lowest point um, is kind of it's a dip in the centre. And when you're titrating with, say, hydrochloric acid and the solution is completely transparent, that's really easy to see from the side. But when you've got um, a much darker solution, it's much harder to see that. Now, one way you can get around that is by using really dilute potassium permanganate to make it a bit easier to see because the solution is a bit more transparent. Now, as we said, this titration with ethane dioate ions is pretty much exactly the same as with the iron ions. We've got the same equipment and we're going to have that same colour change. We start out with a colourless solution in the colical flask and then eventually when all of the um, reagent there has reacted, the next drop of potassium permanganate, the first one that is in excess, will turn that conical flask purple. Now, the one thing that you need to know about this reaction with the oxalate ions is that because they are negative and so are the manganate ions, they're obviously going to repel each other. Now, we know from collision theory that in order to react, two particles need to collide and they also need to have the activation energy. But because they're repelling each other, it's relatively unlikely that they will collide. So the reaction is quite slow to start with, although it is an example of an autocatalytic um, reaction. So that means it catalyzes itself. One of the products acts as a catalyst. So these manganese two plus ions that are being produced here are able to work um, to catalyze the reaction between those two anions. But the other thing that we can do to actually make this reaction uh, feasible and to happen in a reasonable amount of time is that we heat it up to 60 degrees before we do the titration. As we've said, there isn't actually a huge amount of difference between the acid base titrations that you're quite familiar with now and these redox titrations. The biggest difference is that instead of using a pH indicator, we're relying on the reaction to be self indicating. Also, if you're titrating to find the concentration of ethane dioate ions, you are going to need to heat that solution up to 60 degrees in order to make the anions interact with each other. So here's an example of a, a redox titration calculation. A solution is thought to contain hexaqua ion ions and 25 centimetres cubed of that solution was added to 25 centimetres cubed of sulfuric acid and then made up to 250 centimetres cubed in a volumetric flask. Now, this is a really common trick. They'll add in extra numbers that just kind of make things a little bit more challenging. As interesting as it is that they've diluted it with some sulfuric acid, that really does not matter. What I'm interested in is the fact that I started out with 25 centimetres cubed of solution and it's now 10 times more dilute. And I'm going to have to take account of that in my calculation. But the amount of sulfuric acid is not relevant here. A 25 centimetre cubed sample of the solution that I have in my volumetric flask was titrated with a 0.02 molar solution of potassium permanganate. At the end point, 16 centimetres cubed of potassium permanganate had been added. So remember, we're going to see a colour change where the colourless solution is going to go bright purple as soon as those manganate ions are in excess. Calculate the concentration of iron ions in the original solution. So the very first thing that I always do with a quantitative question, whether it's theoretical yield or whether it's um, a titration, is I always look for what can I work out the moles of. So here I've got both the concentration and the volume of my potassium permanganate ions. And I know that concentration is the number of moles divided by the volume. So if I rearrange that equation, I can have um, volume times by concentration is moles.
So my moles of potassium permanganate is 0.02. That's um, the concentration from here. Multiplied by um, 0.016. That's my volume from here. And obviously I divided it by a thousand because it needs to be in decimeters cubed, not centimeters cubed. And that's my number of moles. And I would say it's really worth you spending the sort of half a minute that it takes you, not even that, to annotate your calculation like this and say that is my moles of potassium permanganate. And the reason that it's really worth you doing that is in case you make a mistake, because your examiner is allowed to give you error carried forward marks, but only if they know for certain what a particular number is meant to be. So say if I'd written out this calculation and then I'd missed a decimal place, um, they would be able to see quite clearly that was what it was supposed to be and give me error carried forward. But if, say, I'd completely misrearranged my equation for concentration over here, and so I just, I don't know, I'd, I'd done um, the volume divided by the concentration or something completely ridiculous, it wouldn't be obvious from the numbers what that was hoping to achieve. And so they wouldn't then be able to give me error carried forward. Whereas if I've said, oh, that's the moles of potassium permanganate, then they can. So it is really worth you taking the time to annotate your calculations as you go. So in order to do my next step, I'm going to need the equation. I know now that I've got 0.00032 moles of potassium permanganate, but the equation tells me that for every one manganate ion, I'm going to have five iron ions being oxidized. And so I'm going to need to multiply those um, manganate ions by five. So now I've got my moles of iron two plus. Now that's in 25 centimeters cubed that came from the volumetric flask. So in the entire volumetric flask, I had 10 times more ions. And then remember that those 10 times more ions all came from the original sample. So my original sample had 0 0.0160 um, moles in it in 25 centimeters cubed. And so in my original um, in my original sample, the concentration was going to be 0 0.0160 divided by 0 0.025, because again, I've converted it to decimeters cubed, and that gives me a concentration of 0 0.6. The other thing that can be a little bit different with these redox titrations is that instead of being asked to work out the concentration of a solution, you may be asked to do something with masses. So it's really common to use redox titration for um, compounds containing iron and maybe looking at some iron tablets or some spinach or some thyme or something. So quite often there's an extra step at the end where rather than working out concentration, we work out a mass of iron and then use that mass to work out percentage purity. So a student dissolved 5000 milligrams of iron tablets in sulfuric acid. The solution was titrated against 0.01 mole of potassium permanganate and 45 centimetres cubed was required to reach the end point in the titration. And now we're going to calculate the percentage of iron in the sample. So just like we did before, our very first step is to work out the moles of whatever we can work it out of. So we've got a volume for the potassium permanganate and we've got a concentration for the potassium permanganate. And if we multiply those two numbers together, then we have a number of moles. Again, we're going to use the same equation that we had before. So here's my, um, my ionic equation. And again, I can see that I'm going to have five times more iron than manganate. So I multiply my number of moles by five. Then I need to convert that into a mass by multiplying the number of moles by the relative atomic mass of iron. And now I'm in a position to be able to work out the percentage purity. Although obviously watch out for the fact that this is in grams and my original mass up here was in milligrams. So you need to convert one or the other. It doesn't really matter which. So my percentage purity is going to be 125.55 milligrams divided by 5,000 milligrams multiplied by 100% to make it a percentage, which gives me 2.511. But wait, there is one more step. The smallest number of significant figures in any of the numbers I'm given in the question is three. So I'm going to round to 2.51. In this final redox titration calculation, we're titrating against potassium ferrioxalate. And really, it's very similar to the previous question in that we're trying to work out the percentage purity of the original sample. So a student weighed out 1.175 grams of impure potassium ferrioxalate and dissolved it in water. This solution was made up to 250 centimetres cubed. 
A 25 centimetre cubed portion was pipetted into a conical flask and excess acid was added. That mixture was titrated with 0.01 mole of potassium permanganate. 24.40 centimetres cubed of potassium permanganate solution was needed for a complete reaction and we're trying to calculate the percentage purity of the original sample. So as with the previous two questions, the first thing we want to do is to work out the moles of whatever we can work out the moles of, which for all three questions has been the potassium permanganate. So 0.0244, because we've divided it by 1000 to turn it into decimeters cubed, multiplied by 0.01 is going to be that many moles. I've got a slightly different equation this time around because it's not the iron ions that I'm um, titrating against, it's the oxalate ions or the ethane diorate ions. So this time I've got a 5 to 2 ratio. So I take my number of moles and I divide it by 2 because that's the coefficient in front of um, the manganate iron. And then I multiply it by 5, which is the coefficient in front of the ethane diorate iron, the oxalate iron. And I get a total number of moles of 0.00061. I'm then going to work out how many moles there are in my entire solution. Because remember, I had 250 centimetres cubed, but I actually um, I only titrated against 25. So I multiply that number of moles by 10. Then I'm going to work out how many moles there are of my entire compound. Because remember, this compound is a bit like a multi-pack. So each mole of this compound has one mole of ethane diorate ions in it. Um, and so we're going to need to um, divide by three. And then from there, I can work out a mass. So um, if I work out the MR of this compound, it comes out as 491.1. And if I multiply that, I get 0.99857 grams. So then to finish off, I need percentage purity. So I do the mass that I actually have divided by the mass I expected to have, multiplied by 100%, turn it into a percentage. And the last thing I'm going to do is look for the smallest number of significant figures in the question, which is three. And so I'm going to write my answer to three significant figures, which is 85.0%. Thanks for watching. I hope that was a useful introduction to the tricky topic of redox titrations, and you're now feeling slightly more confident about how to do the calculations for them. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos.